We're back in Acts chapter 27 today. Acts 27. I'll give you a hint about what the message is about today. Some of you don't even know what that was. So, what was it? That's it. What happened to Gilligan? His shipwreck. And so we're looking at his shipwreck today in Acts chapter 27. And we're going to see Paul in the midst of a shipwreck. And what's interesting is we're going to see Paul uh, be a leader in the midst of the shipwreck. We're going to see Paul give some lifelines to the people that are in the midst of the, do, 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 the shipwreck. And we're going to learn some things today as we go through Acts chapter 27 of how do we handle storms? What are some lifelines that God wants us to use in the midst of storms that we're going to face? We're going to face? Now, if you're, if you're a Christian with a pulse, you're going to have some storms. Jesus promised that. He said in John 16, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage, I've overcome the world. Now that's a promise we don't like sometimes, but it's a promise that if you're in a cursed world, you're going to have some trials, some tribulations. The good news, Jesus said, I've overcome the world. And he's going to help us as we go through this scripture, learn some principles from Acts 27 that will help us overcome the storms that we might face in our lives. Because we're all going to deal with storms as we go through a cursed world. No one gets a pass in this. It's part of living in a world that's messed up. And it's not until we get to heaven that we're not going to have any issues or storms that we're going to face. We're all going to deal with stuff like this. We're going to deal with financial storms at times. We're going to deal with health storms at times. We're going to deal with marriage or relational storms. We're going to deal with family storms. We're going to deal with kids' storms at times. We're going to deal with uh, all different issues as we go through this world. But the, the key is learning how to deal with these issues in a way that will become better people instead of bitter people. That will become closer to Christ instead of farther from Christ because of the storms that we face. And I don't know about you, but if i got to face storms, I want to at least get something out of it. I want to grow from it. I want to become more like Christ. I want to become a better person because I've endured the storm with the proper faith and with the proper lifelines. And so we're going to learn about that today, how to deal with storms. And we're going to now the context. Paul, if you remember, back in Acts 26, 25, he was in Caesarea because he had been arrested. False charges in Jerusalem. And then they wanted to kill him in Jerusalem. There was 40 guys that had taken a vow, we're not gonna eat or drink until we kill Paul. And so they ushered him out with you know, the soldiers to uh, the capital of Israel uh, for the Roman Empire, which is Caesarea. And so Paul spends two years in Caesarea. He faces the governor at the time, who was Felix. That governor got fired. They brought a new governor in called Festus. He faced Festus. And then he faced uh, King Agrippa, we saw a couple weeks ago. But nothing was getting accomplished. So finally what Paul did, he says, I appeal to Caesar. He was a Roman citizen. And he had the privilege of that position of being a Roman citizen that if he didn't like what was going on with his trials, he could appeal to face the emperor himself. So now Paul is being shipped from Caesarea, the capital of the Israel for the Roman Empire, and he's being shipped from Caesarea to Rome. And he's in the Mediterranean. And we're going to see he's on this uh, Alexandrian ship with 276 other passengers. It was a bread ship. It was a ship that was bringing supplies uh, to Rome. And so that's the context. Let's jump in now. Acts 27, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, here we go. Acts 27, 1. And when it was decided that we should set sail for Italy, which is Rome, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Now, centurions, remember, they were soldiers, Roman soldiers, that had at least 100 other Roman soldiers under their leadership. This was a leader of men, just Julius. And embarking on an adramatic Adramation ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. And the next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. Now this is a rare exception. Paul's a prisoner, but because he was so trusted by the centurion, the centurion said, you could go as we have this poor time, you could go visit your friends. Paul was a man of integrity to the point that the, the centurion trusted him to leave. Now, if Paul left and escaped, 
they could have executed this centurion. The, the penalty for losing a prisoner was you face the charges that that prisoner had. So this was a real trust thing by the centurion for Paul to go and to receive care and go to his friends. Verse 4, and from there we put out to sea and sailed under the sh shelter of Cyprus. Cyprus is another island in the Mediterranean because the winds were contrary. And when we sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. And there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy to Rome. And he put us aboard it. And when we had sailed slowly for a good many days with difficulty, we had arrived off Snidus. Since the wind did not permit us to go further, we sailed under the shelter of Crete. Crete's another island in, in, Mes in, um, in uh, the uh, Mediterranean. And they were off of Salmone. And with difficulty, sailing past it, we came to a, a certain place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. And when, we considered time, when considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. Now, listen to this. They're, they're coming to October. The fast was the fast of the Day of Atonement. And it was a time where it got dangerous sailing. And now, after October, they didn't even sail. After October, what they did is they wintered because no one would sail during the wintertime because of all the storms. And they would just have to put, uh, set up at the port that they were at and just wait until the winter passed. Now, it was questionable to, 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 to sail during the, this time of the fast, which was about October, because already storms were brewing and it was a dangerous time. So look what Paul does. Verse 10, and he said to them, men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be attended with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached, look, look at the word, majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix. That's not Arizona. <laughs> it's Phoenix, which was a harbor on this island of Crete. They wanted to get around to Phoenix facing southwest and northwest is to spend the winter there. And when the moderate south wind came, supposing that they had gained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close and shore. Now I want you to see something here. The, the, it, was, it was a dangerous time to sail, but they didn't want to stop in Fair Havens. Why? Because Fair Havens was a podunk town. There was nothing to do there. And the sailors and the captain and everything said, we are going to be bored out of our minds for the rest of the winter here. It, it kind of sounds like a small town, doesn't it? Fair havens. And so they said, we don't want to stop here. We want to get around the island of Crete to Phoenix. Phoenix was a place where they could party. Phoenix was a place where there was all kinds of action and stuff that they could do for the wintertime. They were in their flesh. And they wanted to get around the island so they could have something to do for the rest of the wintertime. But Paul, look what Paul does. He stands up. And against the majority, he says, this is not a good idea. We should not do this. And I perceive if we go through this dangerous time of sailing, we will not only have loss of cargo and ship, but we'll have loss of life. And it's interesting because the centurion, even though he respected Paul, he let him go and see friends and stuff, he went with the majority, probably because the centurion didn't want to be stuck in fair havens too, and he also listened to the pilot of the ship and, and, the, and the, the leaders of the, and the majority of the ship. But you know what leaders do? It doesn't wouldn't matter what the majority says. Leaders admonish. And leaders like Paul, if there's something that he knows is right and wrong. And listen, Paul had some experience, by the way, too. We know from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul had already been through three shipwrecks and spent a night and a day in the deep. And so he knew what he was talking about. He had, he had traveled in three missionary journeys, 3,500 miles by land and sea. And again, he had already been through three shipwrecks. He knew what was, what was happening here. And so he as a leader stood up and said, I could see what's happening here, and we should not do this. Now, Paul was just a prisoner. But he stands up and he makes a leadership call and admonishes the whole ship and all 276 people, don't do this. I'm, I'm pointing this out for a reason. Because as Christians... We're not just supposed to go with the flow of the world, are we? As Christians, we're supposed to stand up and say, this is right and this is wrong. The Bible says as Christians, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 
And folks, as, especially as the world's getting darker and we're getting closer to the end, we need Christians to be leaders. We need to be, as Christians, we need to be able to stand up, even if the majority says, this is the way we should go. If it's wrong, we should stand up and say, this is wrong. This is not the way we should go. I'm so grateful for the leadership that was in my life before I even came to Christ. So grateful I had a young man in my life that was witnessing to me and saying, hey, you're going the wrong way. And he would tell me things I didn't want to hear, but he was telling me things I needed to hear, right? So grateful after I became to Christ, I, I had uh, some other people in my life that as I started veering in my Christian life and doing wrong things, they'd get in my face and they'd say, this is right and this is wrong, and he, John, you don't want to go that way, that's the wrong way. Remember one of my favorite Christian artists at the time was Keith Green, I remember listening to him, and he was so strong about living a no compromise life, and I'd start compromising, i listen to Keith Green, and I'd just get, bam! He would just hit me over the side of the head with exhortation, no compromise. Make your life a prayer, John, to, to God. Don't compromise, don't compromise. So grateful that I got involved with Calvary Chapel that taught me the word of God. And one of the things with the word of God, you sit under the teaching of God's word, you're gonna be taught this is right and this is wrong. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to that word. Thy word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And as we st- Teach God's word here. Sometimes you're gonna walk out of here and say, Pastor John, quit stepping on my toes. And you know what? I ain't stepping on anybody's toes. It might be the word of God that might be stepping on your toes. And you know what? If the shoe fits, wear it. And if you're getting convicted on something, let it exhort you and admonish you and warn you to get back on the right path. And that's what Paul's doing here. Is we're going the wrong way, guys. And he's admonishing the whole ship. Don't do this. Look what happens, verse 14. But before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called a Uroquillo. That just doesn't sound good, does it? Uroquillo. And when the ship was caught in it, they could not face the wind, and we gave way to it, and let ourselves be driven along. And running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. And after they hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship. Now, the, the ship was getting slammed so hard in this storm, they were putting cables underneath the ship so that the wood of the ship wouldn't be destroyed and devastated. I don't know how they were doing it, but somehow they were running cables underneath the supporting cables underneath the ship. And fearing that they might, they might run aground in the shallows of Sartus, they let down the sea anchor so, let, so they let themselves be driven along. Now they're putting an anchor down so they're not just driven out to the high seas and not knowing where they're going. The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. You know it's getting bad when they start throwing the cargo off the ship, just to try to save themselves from having too much weight on the ship in the midst of the storm. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. So they're even throwing over the tackle, which is their means for having food. They're throwing it over just to try to save the ship. And since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small storm was assailing us, from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually banned. Now remember, this is before GPS. How would they have direction set? How would they know where to go? By the sun and the stars. And the, and the, the, the storm is so bad that they can't even see the sun and the stars stars anymore. I mean, I get seasick just thinking about this. You know, I, I, my dad was a sailor. He had a, a, a 36-foot sailboat that he would sail in the uh, Chicago, Lake Michigan area. And I went on two trips with him where he, he raced Wednesday nights and then Saturdays on the weekend. And t- he wanted me to get into it, so I, I went on one or two, actually two races with him. Both times, there's real choppy water on Lake Michigan. Both times, I got sicker than a dog. Oh, I was, <sighs> I mean, I was over the side, for, and, and the worst thing was my dad was so competitive, he said, we ain't quitting this race, so we'll, we'll bring you back to shore when we're done with the race. <laughs> By the second time of that experience, I told my dad, Dad, I love you, I love that you have a passion for this sailing, but I will never do this with you ever again. You know what I'm talking about with motion sickness and everything? These guys are facing this now for days and nights. Just a Uroquillo kind of storm is hitting them. They can't even see the sun or the stars. Verse 21. And when they had gone a long time without food, why were they going without food? Probably they were sicker than dogs. And they said, you're not going to eat when you're in the midst of this. 
And then Paul stood up in the midst and said, men, <laughs> look at Paul. Don't you hate this when people do this when they're right? <laughs> men, you ought to have followed my advice. In other words, I told you so. You ought to follow my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage loss. Now, husbands, can you relate at all? How many times have, you, have your wife said, sweetheart, I don't think this is a good idea, and you charge ahead, and you do it anyways, and you're wrong, and then your sweetheart comes up to you, I told you so. You shouldn't have done this, sweetheart. I learned a long time ago, before making major decisions, it's a real good idea to check in with my wife and heed her counsel oftentimes because oftentimes she's got a wisdom that I'm not seeing in an area and I hate hearing, I told you so, although she doesn't really do that. She's, 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 she, but she, she's got wisdom. My wife's got wisdom. And husbands, your wife's got wisdom too. And it's best to check in and have a team decision on major, major decisions. Amen? Can I get an amen, wives? Amen. amen. So Paul says, I told you so. No, he says, you shouldn't have done this. Verse 22, and yet now I urge you. What's he saying to these, these 276 passengers? I urge you. What does he say to them? Keep up your courage, for there shall be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Now notice what Paul says. He's being a witness. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong, whom I serve, stood before me, saying to me, Paul, do not be afraid. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I've been told, but we must run aground on a certain island. Okay, first lifeline. I told you I'd give you some lifelines in storms. First lifeline is the promises of God. Remember, God made a promise to Paul. Paul, discouraged earlier in the book of Acts, was told by God, that he was going to be, go to Rome. He's, it was told uh, to Paul back in Acts 23, 11, On that night, immediately following, the Lord stood at Paul's side and said, Take courage, for as you have soundly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must what? Witness where? Rome. So the promise to Paul was, you're going to go to Rome. Now, Paul's in the midst of this awful storm. Everybody thinks they're going to die. And an angel appears to Paul again and reaffirms that promise. And that angel says, says same thing. Keep up your courage. And, and, and he's very clear to Paul. He says, don't be afraid, verse 24, you must stand before Caesar. Where at? In Rome. And then he says, behold, God has granted you all those are sent. And the promise was not only are you going to Rome, you're going to make it to Rome here, but everybody that's with you is going to make it to Rome too. Here's the first lifeline in the midst of a storm. The promises of God. The promises of God. And when you have a storm, just like Paul's facing a storm here, that's why it's so important that you stay in God's word. Because where are the promises of God found? Right here in his word. There's hundreds of promises throughout this book that will help fortify you in the midst of any storm that you face. It's so important to be in God's word and to stand on God's promises in the midst of storms when they hit your life. I'll give you some examples. You got a financial storm? Don't know how the bills are gonna get paid? Go back to God's word, the promises of God. Philippians 4, 19 says, my God shall supply all your needs according to the riches of Christ Jesus, right? I'll give, give you some other storms. Uh, you got a kid storm. <laughs> you got a kid that's going AWOL. You got, a kid, you got a kid that's just not going the direction you should be going. Go back to the promises of God and stand in God's promises. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us, train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he will what? Not going to depart from it. You could trust in God's promises there. God will bring him back, bring him, bring him back in place. And he's not going to depart from what he's been trained in. He'll come back. You have a, a health storm. And you got a problem with your health and stuff is just, you know, with, with health issues. Go back to God's promises. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. Plans not for calamity but for welfare. To give you a future and a hope. And go back to Isaiah 53, verse 5, that says that Jesus, by his stripes, by his scourging, we are healed. 
Or go back to Romans 8, 28 that says, and God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. The promises of God, so important, so important to stick with those promises. Uh, if you're down and you're struggling and you're just depressed in a storm of depression, go back to God's word. And uh, Nehemiah 8.10 says, and the joy of the Lord will be my strength. And stand on that and say, hey, the Lord's got joy for me. And the fruit of the Spirit is not only love, but it's joy. And in his presence, Psalm 1611, in his presence is fullness of joy. Go back to those promises. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And that's why it's so important to stay in God's word when storms are hidden. Because God's word are the promises we could stand on and believe in and hope in and listen, have courage in. We get an encouragement as we stay in. Encouragement comes from the scriptures and the promises of God. I remember when we first started this church, we started with uh, two adults and four kids. Heidi and I and our four kids. Didn't know anybody. We started the church. We got off to a good start. We had a good first service, Easter Sunday, 1997. But then summer hit. And what happens during summer? People go on vacation and people are, go, you know, everything else. We were down to like 40 people the first summer. And I'm thinking, whoa, I don't know if we're going to make it. And I got some discouragement going when we first started the church. I only had 40 people. And I remember I was praying, Lord, are we, you know, we moved here to start this church, but are we going to become the homeless hoppies here? What's going on? And I remember the Lord gave me a promise. He turned me back to the Gospels when Peter was confessing Christ as the Savior. And then uh, Jesus said to Peter, uh, Matthew, um, actually in the Gospels, is he said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's a promise I hung on to for that first year when we started the church. Jesus, it's not my church, it's your church. You've promised to build it and you're going to and I trust you for that. And it helped me turn the corner from discouragement and the storm of discouragement there to just hoping and believing and taking courage. See how the promises of God can help us in the midst of a storm? But we've got to grab onto them. We've got to stay in God's word and believe in them and trust in them. As we sang this morning, God's a promise, promise keeper. He, he, he will. He's, he's a promise maker and a promise keeper. He'll keep his promises, but we need to stand on them. Amen? Okay, now, second lifeline we'll see in verse 27. It says, but when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. And they took some soundings, and they found it to be 20 fathoms. And a little farther on, the, on they took another sounding, and they found it to be 15 fathoms. Now, soundings, what's that? It's a rope with a weight on it. They put the rope in the water, and they lower it. And they'd, they'd, they'd do this because they thought that they might be approaching some land. Sure enough, they put the rope in the, in the water with the weight, and all of a sudden they realized the weight hit the bottom of the ground. They're at 20 fathoms. Now, a fathom is six feet. So they say, we're, we're to 120 feet deep. And then they went a little bit closer, and all of a sudden they took another sounding, and it went to, to 15 fathoms, which is 90 feet. What's that telling them? They're approaching land. And so they're taking soundings, they're doing their homework here to, to find out that they're getting close to land. Now that's important for them to do that too because there's all kinds of uh, 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 little areas, reefs and other things close to these islands and they could have problems if they didn't prepare for the uh, sand and the reefs that they were approaching for this island. So they're taking soundings. Here's a second lifeline, important, I gather from this. Do your homework and gather information when you're in the midst of a storm. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is sometimes it's important for us um, in the midst of a storm to get some more information, to get some more help, to get some people that can give us some wise counsel in the midst of the storm. I remember when Heidi and I were a young married couple, we had started our first church. Not a good idea. It was one of those decisions I should have Prayed about some more, or whatever else. We got married in July, 1986, and we moved to a brand new community where we didn't know anybody to start our first church in September of 1986 also. And we, we, we got off the ground running, had a good start to our first church in, in Carlsbad, California, 
Uh, but at the same time, there was a lot of stress. 24 years old, starting our first church in a community where we didn't know anybody. And I remember then, we, we got it rolling, we got the church started after a couple years and stuff, and then we started having kids. And it was great, it's an adventure, it was fun. But you know kids, babies, can bring some more stress, amen? amen. <laughs> and they did. And the first kid we had was John G, and he was the easiest kid we ever, I mean, it's so easy. So I said, well, that was easy, let's have another one. <laughs> then we had David, and David was a challenging, you know strong-willed kids? David was a strong-willed kid. And so we had, had these babies, brand new church, brand new community, all this ooh, stress going on stuff, and I realized a few years into our marriage that we needed some help. We did. And we got some took some soundings like this, and I gathered some information, found a Christian counselor in our uh, area where I was pastoring. We got some marriage counseling. That's some soundings, some information, some research I did to find some help, and you know what? It really helped. And the biggest thing, I'm looking back on the, 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 the counseling we got in the, after a few years of marriage, the biggest thing that helped Heidi and I was just getting some more information. And the information that that marriage counselor told us as we were going through some counseling was we were both very strong-willed people, really? <laughs> and that we have a tendency, it's gotta be this way or it's gotta be this way. John, you're saying it's gotta be this way. Heidi, you're saying it's gotta be this way. And you know what the counselor said? It doesn't have to be both your ways. You could compromise and meet somewhere in the middle. And we've done that for the last, well, July 12th will be 31 years of marriage now. We've learned to make compromises and meet each other in the middle and not be these two strong, stubborn, Dutch-headed Dutch people that have to have it this way, right? But it was because of some information we gathered and some wise counsel we got that helped us in that relational storm we were having a few years into marriage. And so I think it's important when we're in the midst of a storm, whether it's a relational storm, whether it's a financial storm, whether it's a health storm, whatever it is, Take some soundings. Gather some more information. Get some wise counsel, and it'll help you work through the storm. And that's what the, the people are doing here now. They're taking soundings. They're getting information. So they're ready for this land that's approaching in the midst of the storm. Verse 29. And fearing that we might run aground somewhere in the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern, <laughs> and they wished for daybreak. And as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship, they let down the ship's boat into the sea. Now the ship's boat is like a dinghy. So they're trying to get off the, off this big ship onto the dinghy to get to shore. And on pre pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion, to the soldiers, unless these men remain on the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. And then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. That's the dinghy. And until the day was about dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food. Um, saying, today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating and haven't taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you, take some food, Paul's saying to them, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you shall perish. And having said this, he took some bread and he gave thanks. Paul's being a witness now to the whole ship. He's encouraging them to eat and then he's blessing the food. To God in the presence of all, and he broke it and he began to eat and all of them were what? Encouraged by Paul. And they themselves also took food. Here's the next lifeline, really important. When you're in the midst of a storm, really important, it's important to take care of yourself physically. What's Paul doing here? He's telling you guys, you haven't eaten for 14 days. Now there's a reason why they hadn't eaten for 14 days. They're going through this huge storm. They've probably had motion sickness and seasickness and everything else, but also they've been stressed. They hadn't seen the sun or the stars or anything. They didn't know where they were at. They're in the middle of the Mediterranean or Adriatic Sea, wherever. They didn't even know where they were going. They're too stressed to even eat. But what does Paul do? He says, hey, it's time to take care of yourself physically. Eat some food. You know what? Sometimes we're in the midst of a storm and we, we let go of taking care of ourselves physically. We don't eat right. We sleep less. We work more. We don't, and it's just the opposite. is we, we need to ramp up our physical disciplines of anything when we're in the midst of a storm. Why? So that you're physically strong enough to make it through the storm. Do you see that? I remember uh, 
You know, in 2014, after um, just a crazy year of busyness and stress and everything else, I got this virus, this conjunctivitis in my right eye, and then the virus went, uh, broke up in pieces, and then I had other issues with, with actually the, the pieces of the virus got in my cornea, and I started having some, I never had health problems for 50-some years of my life. I started having some major health issues. And you know what? I, I realized that in the midst of these health issues, I needed to ramp it up physically to take care of myself so I could make it through the storm of this virus that I had and this issue with cornea and all this other stuff going on. And so I, I took some drastic measures uh, physically. <laughs> I, I went to this health institute down in Florida, and they taught me nutrition and all this stuff. And I, I tell you what, up until I had these health issues, I ate whatever I wanted to eat, and I, I enjoyed it. I had a sweet tooth. But I learned the, the, the how bad, when I went to this health institute, I learned how bad, how bad sugar is for you. So you know what? Ever since I've had this virus, I, I'd make exceptions. I have a cheat day every once in a while. But as a whole, I don't eat sugar anymore. I, I had to ramp it up physically to get through that whole storm I was dealing with. I, don't, I, I learned the, the poison of, of, of not only sugar, but also of, of, of caffeine. And so I don't, I don't do any caffeine. Heidi and I both don't do caffeine anymore. I, I learned also the importance of staying away from certain things like bread and other things like that. So we don't, I don't do bread anymore. Now again, I'll make some exceptions every once in a while, but I had to ramp it up physically and take care of myself physically a little bit better. And it helped me through the storm of the health storm that I went through to, to ramp it up physically. I, I got two watches on for a reason. I always have this watch and this watch. You know why? Because this watch tells me how many steps I do every day. And I remember when I was going through this virus thing and everything else, like the Lord said, you need to start exercising every day. So I do 10,000 steps every day. And like last night, I didn't get my 10,000 steps in, so Heidi and I took the dogs for a walk, and I got my 10,000 steps in. And so we need to be careful when, when the storms are hitting. We need to sometimes take drastic measures even physically to take care of ourselves so we could be physically strong enough to make it through the storm. And that's what Paul's doing with these soldiers and other people on the ship. He's telling them, time to eat, time to take care of yourself physically. Amen? Amen. We need to be careful with our health, especially when a storm is hitting. Now let's close up our story. So they eat, and then it says in verse 37, and all of us in the ship were 276 persons. It's a big, big ship. And when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten up the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. And when the day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a certain bay with a beach. Now, interesting, if you go to the island of Crete today, uh, there's still a bay. It's this bay that they're coming into. It's called St. Paul's Bay. And it's named for what happened here with Paul coming on, on shore on, on, on this island. Interesting. And so, actually, it's the island of Malta, not Crete in St. Paul's Bay. And then they, they resolved to, to drive the ship in, onto if, uh, the, 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 the shore if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, while at the same time, they were loosening up the ropes of the rudders and hoisting the foresail to the wind. They were heading for the beach. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground. Interesting, they ran it right into the, the sandbar. And the prow stuck fast and remained immovable, but the, but the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. And the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners that none of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion wanted to bring Paul safely through, kept them from the intention, and commanded that those who would, could swim should jump up overboard first and get to land. And the rest should follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship. And thus it happened that they were all brought safely to land." Now, that's interesting. The soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners. Why? Because if any prisoners escaped, what would be their lot of soldiers? They would be executed in place of those prisoners. But again, this centurion had so much respect for Paul, they said, no, we can't kill the prisoners. This Paul just saved all our lives. And so let's, let's just let them sim, swim uh, to the land, and it'll be okay. And the centurion, interesting, centurions have always been portrayed throughout the scriptures in the New Testament in a positive light. Remember the one centurion that had a sick servant? And Jesus said, well, I'll come and I'll, I'll heal your servant. What did he say to Jesus? He said, I'm a man of authority 
and I'm under authority, and I know if I tell somebody to do something, they'll do it, or if I'm told somebody over me to do something, I'll do it. And he says, and, I, and the centurion said, and I know, Jesus, if you just speak the word, my servant will be healed. And it says that Jesus marveled at the centurion's faith. There's another centurion that was by Jesus at the cross. And after you saw Jesus' words and actions on the cross, that other centurion said this, truly, this was the Son of God. The first Gentile convert in the book of Acts was a centurion named Cornelius, and he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. He and his whole household and the people in his household got saved. These centurions were men of honor. And so this centurion now says, no, we're not gonna kill the prisoners because if we kill the prisoners, we'll kill Paul, and Paul just saved our lives. And so what do they do? Paul says, you can't, you, we, gotta sw- we gotta swim and get to shore. And so what does the centurion do? He says, get overboard, grab a plank, and swim. That's the last thing I wanna give you for a lifeline. Sometimes when we're in a storm, we just gotta grab a plank and swim. What do I mean by that? Sometimes when a storm hits, we can get paralyzed in the midst of the storm. We can have a a paralysis of analysis. (laughs) We just get stuck in the storm. In the midst of that, I think it's important sometimes to take some initiative and grab a plank and start swimming. You know, I think sometimes we have this attitude, well, I'm just gonna let go in the storm. I'm just gonna let go and let God. And I get that. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I get that. And if any time we need to trust God, it's in the midst of the storm. That's why I started the lifelines with saying we need to trust God and his promises, Amen. But also in the midst of a storm, sometimes God wants us to take some initiative. God says, go, grab a, grab a plank and swim, man. And that's why I said it's important to take soundings. So that's part of the initiative sometimes. Do some more research. Get some more information. Find some things, some counsel that can help you. And sometimes we gotta take initiative in the midst of the storm to get help and to do things that will help us get through the storm. Again, when I was going through this virus thing and stuff like that, I had these um, particles from the virus get into my eye, and I had some major eye issues and inflammation in my cornea and all this other stuff, and it wasn't going away. And so I remember I finally found a guy down in Tampa, Florida. I've made several trips now to Dr. Maskin in, in Tampa, Florida, and he's helped me. But it was like God was telling me, you know, grab a plank and swim. Find someone that can help you. And sometimes we need to do that in the midst of the storms we face. Hey, Amen? Sometimes we need to get some grit <laughs> and, and look for some help and grab a plank and what? And swim. So what are the four things, lifelines, we looked at this morning? Four things that are going to help us. First thing, probably the most important thing, promises of God. We need to take courage because we've been given promises in God's book and stand and believe in those promises in the midst of the storm. Second thing, we saw a lifeline. Sometimes we gotta gather some more information, take some soundings. What are some, what are some wise counsels, some information that'll help us in the midst of any kind of storm that we might be facing? Third thing we saw this morning, very important, is um, take care of yourself in the midst of a storm. Take care of yourself physically. Get exercise. Have some physical, ramp up some physical disciplines in your life that will help you be strong in the midst of the storm that you're facing. And lastly, we saw sometimes we just got to grab a plank and what? And swim. Amen? Amen. All right. See, some of you out there are going like this right now. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much this morning for your word. Thank you, God, for your promises, Lord. Your promises are yes and amen. We could believe in all the promises that you've given us, Lord, and we trust in them this morning. Help us to be people of faith, God. And I pray for people that might be here this morning that there's some storms going on. And Father, I pray that in the midst of their storms, they grab that lifeline of the promises of God. They would, as we said this morning already, that they would trust in you with all their heart, lean not on their own understanding, in all their ways just acknowledge you, Father, so you can direct their paths and make their paths straight, Father. 
And Father, help us to be people too in the midst of storms that take care of ourselves physically, that get the exercise we need and the uh, rest we need and the time we need uh, to um, be careful with our health, Lord. Father, I pray too that we be people that when we're in the midst of a struggle in life that we would take some soundings if necessary, get some more information, some wise counsel, Lord, that can help us. And Father, I pray too that if we need to take initiative and get out there and get some help from people or whatever area that we're struggling in, Lord, help us not to get stuck in that, Lord. Help us to not be in paralysis in the midst of crisis, Lord. Help us to, if necessary, take initiative by your leadership and your guiding, Lord. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you're a God that stands with us and is for us. You're a God that gives us your presence and your power and your strength. No matter what we face, Lord, even if we're going through a a struggle, Lord, you're there with us in that struggle. You've promised, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And lo, you will be with us always, even to the end of the age. We thank you for your presence this morning, God. We thank you for your power. We thank you for the courage that you give each one of us, Lord. Father, help us to be wise. Help us to be people that trust you no matter what life throws at us, Lord. Help us to be people that keep going forward, as Paul said, and presses on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the strength that you give us on a daily basis. Thank you for your promises that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. We believe that today and we trust in that, Father. And thank you for your word too, Lord. Your word is such a help. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Your word is an anchor and a strength for each one of us because there's promises all throughout your word that help us, Lord. Help us to believe in those promises this morning and stand on them, Lord. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name.